passionate in helping people see the signs of bullying and just helping parents to understand, like, if your child is doesn't want to go to school, like, talk to them and how can we, like, really put a, you know, I'm going to be honest, too, and, and, and say when I saw, like, the suicide, mm. from, I think that's important and a lot of people don't want to talk about that. And I felt like that's another thing that I really wanted to prevent because kids committing suicide is a really big deal. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Journey of a Fearless Female. I am your host, Paola Rosser, and this week, my guest is Tamika Conley. She is a public speaker, an author, an activist, and the co-founder of a music collective. She was also a DJ, an on-air radio personality, host for stations like 102.3 and 88.1 KISS FM radio in Texas. She was also crowned Miss Black and Gold and most talented for penning an original monologue in the pageant honoring the the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. She has a spoken word album called Life, Love, and the Pursuit of Her Dreams. Her written poems have been featured in LA magazines like Rolling Out, Melt, and the LA Sentinel. She is the author of many children's books like I Don't Like Racism, I Don't Like COVID-19, and I Don't Like Bullies. Tamika currently lives in Los Angeles where she enjoys acting, creating content for TV, writing songs, but most of all, her life's mission is to educate children of all ages about the effects that bullying has had on children both inside and outside of school. Everybody, please welcome Tamika. I'm so excited to have you on this show. So let's talk about your fearless female journey. Let's go way back and let's tell us from the beginning. <laughs> wow. Um, thank you for having me. And I'm just so excited. Thank you again for listening to alone, Journey of a Fearless Female. female. I'm it your host, Paola Rosser. And um I like to call myself an entertainment entrepreneur. And you know, in order to be an entrepreneur, whether it's entertainment or anything, you have to be fearless. And so when I think about fearless, it also aligns with my faith. So everything that I do, sometimes I am afraid, but I still, you know, trudge forward. So let's see how we can make a long story short. Like <laughs> Like you said, uh, I'm from Texas, and uh, when I was in Texas, I was always creative. I was always doing, like, you know, the school plays and writing, and, you know, I always enjoyed writing poetry and everything, and then I went to an actor's conservatory, and from there, I thought, oh, I would like to continue this, so I thought I'd move to New York or Los Angeles. 9-11 happened, so I ended up- Oh, my gosh. Ended up in Los Angeles and uh, just was on the journey to uh, do acting. And I had written a script in college and I wanted to sell it. And everybody was like, if the script doesn't pop from the page, then you need to create some kind of audio visual. And so I started on the trek of trying to sell my screenplay and I had to make a short film Mm -hmm. and I knew nothing about you know, the producing aspect of it. And everybody I would go to, they would say these humongous budgets that I couldn't afford. And so I said, I've got to figure out how to do this. That's the fearless (laughs) journey that started the fearless journey. I was afraid because I had never done anything in terms of producing or making a film, you know, on my own, but I knew that I couldn't afford it. So a lot of the things that I've been afforded to do was because I couldn't afford to do them, which sounds yeah. funny. But but I love the way, even though they gave you all these budgets and they were completely out of your realm in that moment, you didn't take it as a no, the doors closed. I love that you said, I'm going to figure out how I can do this. Yes. And that's what it was. I had a script that I had written. And again, I was making calls to different producers and cameramen and lights and makeup and everybody was telling me their prices. And I was like, "Uh." (laughs) so (laughs) that's where I really believe I found negotiating skills because I was just like, well, can you do it for this? And they're like, well, what's your budget? And I'm like, I don't have a budget, but I know that that sounds like I can't afford it. So, you know, And so that's the journey I've been on. I realized from my first film, which was in 2006, which uh, one of the themes in it is about domestic violence. So Mm -hmm. that's a topic 
that that film is about and I'm it's a topic that I feel very passionate about as well um just to interject a little little bit there <laughs> but anywho um so yeah I I have been on that journey since 2006 of now producing and writing films and I still love acting I will say acting will always be my first love but I feel like as a producer I can employ other people. I can bring people on that are makeup artists or wardrobe and all of that. And I get a better sense of fulfillment in coming together in a collaborative effort as opposed to, oh, I'm an actress, look at me, you know. Mm -hmm. That has been one of the fearless things I can say is just becoming a producer and learning it. Didn't have a mentor. I also went to people for mentorship, but I didn't take no. I just figured it out. <laughs> I yeah. love that. People yeah. are surprised that they should be surprised that you think like people aren't going to help you, but there are so many people out there willing to help you. I yeah. mean, me as a mentor and life coach, people come to me all the time and ask me questions. And yes, I give them a little bit of advice, but I also tell them, you know, Hey, these are my coaching programs. But at the same time, it's like, you would be surprised how many people out there are willing to help you because they see you as, oh, I remember what it was like to be in her position, yes. you know? And so they're willing to give you the nuggets of wisdom that they learned along their journey. Yes. And I believe that is my mission. Now, when people come to me, I know what that felt like not to have, you know, the resources or not to know what to do. And I try my best to be different than a lot of the experiences that I had. <laughs> yeah, well, because we know how it felt to have the doors closed on you, you know, or to be told, sorry, can't help you. But yeah. I, I help people all the time. They'll ask me questions about like podcasting or social yeah. media or how to do this. And I'm like, ah, you do this, this and that. Like, you know, rather than some people who are like, oh, you have to buy my course for $500. It's like, really? Mm -hmm. It's just a simple question. Just tell me. <laughs> yeah. But you know, sometimes you do have to kind of balance it because if it gets too much, then yeah, you've worked hard and you are a consultant as well. So, you know, you yeah. don't want to take that for granted. But yeah, you know, exactly. It, yeah. So how did you transition out of, well, not transition because you're still doing the acting and the writing and all that. How did you get into like writing books and creating an album like The Spoken Word? Okay. So again, I love writing. I'm a creative at heart and um, I was writing poetry for a long time and I had went through a really uh, bad breakup, which caused me to really write a lot of poetry. <laughs> and so, um, that tortured soul thing, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. But it was beautiful poetry, but I remember the times when I was writing it. And um, so a lot of it is from uh, the relationships, love, seeking love, uh, things would happen in the world and I would write about it. And so I started writing poetry and when I moved to Los Angeles, I realized there are people that are making this a business, like they go and speak and get paid. And, uh -huh. and so I realized that I could turn this into something and not just have the poetry for me, but now I've got over a hundred and something poems. I can make a book. Yes. And so that's how I started on my journey with my first book. It's called Words Unspoken, Volume One, Deeper Than Eyes Can See. And that was a point, a poetry book. And from there, I started my journey as an author. Wow. And um, my next book was a little, you know, years later. And what happened was the George Floyd when, um, you know, that situation, he was murdered. And I was watching TV and uh, a lot of my friends were talking to me. They were doing the protests. And I was like, I don't want to do the protesting, but what can I do? I felt like I wanted to do something, you know? Yeah. And so I said, oh, well, I'm a writer. You know, I write poetry. Maybe I can write something. And the children's book is a lot like poetry. It's rhymy. And, you know, I just prayed and the, the stuff started downloading. And that's how I got my first children's book during that whole pandemic and the George Floyd situation. And I saw his daughter on TV and she said, my daddy changed the world. And it started to just kind of, I went into my imagination and I thought, what would children think? How do children feel about yeah. racism? 
And that was the first book. From there, I got a great response. I became an Amazon bestseller from the I Don't Like Racism book. Then I thought, what else is going on in the world that affects kids and that we can go into their mind? I did I Don't Like COVID. And now here we are with I Don't Like Bullies because that's another topic. And now I just love being a children's <laughs> yeah. book author. So that's kind of that journey. Oh my gosh. Long story short. (laughs) No. (laughs) Well, we're on a podcast. So this is what we're here to talk about. But I love that you you used what was going on with you emotionally, not just with the breakup, but with, you know, the thing that was going on with George Floyd and COVID-19. All of that sparked a whole new generation of the way children should start thinking about things, you know, because we have these conversations as adults. But children are also big sponges and they're watching, they may not understand like the full capacity of what's really going on, but they pick up on the energy of the adults and they do feel what we're feeling, you know, like what we're feeling during such tumultuous events, like either 9-11 or the George Floyd, or, you know, I was just watching OJ Simpson and when Rodney King was being beaten, I remember that I remember being afraid as a little girl because we used to drive to LA all the time. And I would be afraid, like, can't, does my, should my brother and my dad drive to LA if this is what's happening to people of color, you know? And so you, these are great books to put out there because it could break it down for a child to like really process and, you know, go through the emotions of what the adults are going through, but in their, in their way and version of being able to process, correct? Yes. And really, like the racism book, uh, it's like we all deserve to be loved no matter what our color. And I just really wanted to instill in children their value beyond their race, which is really important. Exactly. Because racism is a taught, right? Racism is taught. So if children are taught that we could actually eliminate it, if we can teach children to love each other, regardless of the skin color, because racism is taught and it's passed down from generation to generation. But if we can start it from the beginning where the programming is starting, we can actually help them understand and have more love and compassion and empathy for one another versus like finding different ways to put ourselves in different categories, which I really hate when people do that. You know, we're always putting ourselves in categories. If it's not a race, it's our religion. If it's not our religion, it's where we grew up. If it's not the East coast or the West coast, it's we're constantly putting ourselves in these categories. And I, you know, I love that you created that book. Also tell us a little bit about the COVID-19 book, because I'm sure a lot of kids hated COVID-19 because you can't go to school and you can't be with your friends and you can't go to the parks and you can't even go outside. I mean, I remember the beginning of COVID-19 where we were afraid to even go to the grocery store because we were afraid of what was going to happen and what was on the packaging. I mean, I can only imagine the side effects that this had on children, like maybe becoming more germaphobe of like having to wash your hands all the time and not touch anything, you know? That's exactly what it was. And just understanding the symptoms like uh all three books they take you on a journey with a young girl named Denila and so Denila is at school and she's like why do I have to like always wash my hands after school before I can have my snack and she was really sad because she couldn't go to school and play with her friends and so yeah it was just even losing some family members she wrote about you know talked about that and so yeah it just really took you on a journey of how kids feel about it but Again, it was to educate kids at that age to know how important it is to wash your hands and all of these things. And with every book also is to maybe educate the teachers even more or the parents or the grandparents. Yeah, exactly. So (laughs) did you self-publish these books? I did. Oh my gosh. How how was the process? Take us through the process of like figuring that that out to be self-published, which is actually... I love that we live in this time and an era where you're not waiting for the gatekeepers to say this book is good enough to be published, where you can actually go and write what you're writing and get it published. But I think writing a children's book is a lot harder than just writing a regular book because you have to have artwork and you have to, you know, you have to make it look beautiful because the kids like need visual more than just writing. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) You know, you have to be fearless. 
to make this happen um, because I, again, I love poetry. So I had that part down, but yes, I had to go through interviewing a lot of illustrators. And on the first book, it was basically, I had a vision and I said, can you just show me the cover? And I, in, as each person that's the illustrator was showing me the cover, I was like, and eh, you know how you just <laughs> like, it's like shopping for a dress. You kind of know when you see it, you don't yeah. quite know exactly what you want, but you know, if I see it, that's it. And there was a young lady uh, that lives overseas and um, I got in touch with her online. And basically when I saw her cover, I said, yes, that is it. She has a little girl crying and she just mm -hmm. captured the vision. And so that's how I selected her and we began to work. Now the process was a lot because some of the things that I were thinking in terms of the art, and like there was one topic in the book that said we're kings and queens and she had illustrated like the England the king the queen in England and in my mind it was the queen in Africa kind of mm -hmm. so it was like <laughs> you know stuff like that where I had to say well this was my vision and you know but it's a process in getting out your vision and your imagination and working with someone and it takes a lot of patience um, but with her, because we worked so well, I decided to continue to work with the same illustrator for the second and third. Nice. Book. Was yeah. the bullying book the third book? Yes. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about how that one came about and why you're so passionate about educating children. I'm a former educator. I did some uh, teaching when I was younger, like during college. And then when I first moved out to LA, it's like a supplemental income. Mm -hmm. I could teach and from the classrooms, you see a lot. And bullying is certainly <laughs> something you see a lot of. And just in the news, I've always saw that bullying is a big thing for kids. And I have a friend and she told me her daughter was dealing with bullying. And so she had to switch schools. And I just really felt like as a children's book author, that should be my mission to try to educate kids and to try to help with topics and bullying is just a really big one and um yeah i released it in october which was uh national bullying awareness month and i it just felt right to yeah. release it during that time and now i'm really passionate in helping people see the signs of bullying and just helping parents to understand like if your child is doesn't want to go to school like talk to them and how can we like really put a you know I'm gonna be honest too and and, and say when I saw like the suicide mm. from, I think that's important and a lot of people don't want to talk about that and I felt like that's another thing that I really wanted to prevent because kids committing suicide is a really big deal and yeah it's happening more and more now than it was when we were growing up um, yes. because we didn't have social media. You know, exactly. the bullying stayed at school. And so you can avoid the bullying by not going to school, right? But exactly. now kids these days have social media. And even if you're like, well, my kid doesn't have any social media, you kids are sneaky. They yeah. have like a, a Snapchat or they have their Roblox or they have some sort of video game platform that they're talking to. And people can be relentless and mean, and they take whatever, you know, negative statement towards them and they really take it to heart. And with everything, with social media and with the ability to Google things, which they shouldn't be Googling, suicide is actually really, really high. You yeah. know, I, I just watched a video the other day where nine and 10 year olds are killing themselves. I'm like a nine and a 10 year old. I mean, that should be bullying. Yeah. yeah, that should not even be at the forefront of their like consciousness. I just can't even imagine a nine or a 10 year old killing themselves over being bullied. And the things are so small because social media is out there. Like I watched this whole thing about a girl who didn't have the the right. Um, what's the new cup thing? It's not the Yeti because I have a Yeti. What's that one? The Stanley Cups. And it was like the huge oh, yeah. Christmas craze. And one of the little girls, you know, the parents couldn't afford a $40 Stanley Cup. And so they gave her like kind of a knockoff. And well, she went to school and they just were relentless with her about not having the the Stanley. And they made videos and posts like, and it's not just, it starts 
there again it's taught bullying is taught bullying is like programmed into us it goes into our like the rest of our life right and it's like people still to this day but if we could stop it at the beginning and teach them like the effects of bullying you know then maybe we can stop having the walking wounded adults doing yes. that to others yes yes you are right. <laughs> and that's <laughs> what I'm thinking. I think every subject, like you said, the bullying, the racism, it starts with the kids. And I study psychology. And so I learned the developmental years are when you're like five and up, you know? And mm -hmm. so you're right. That's when you have to like get it there before we become uh, traumatized adults. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. And sometimes the schools, it's hard because my sisters are teachers and I know how hard it can be to have these conversations because it's, there's so much political aspects and like red tape and administrative that you can't say certain things to the children. And right. you're so busy trying to pass tests that you're not really working on like the emotional concept. You're so busy trying to just teach them so they could pass the test, but you're not really working on the emotional part of it. And a lot of kids don't have the luxury of having two parents at home teaching the emotional aspect of being a human in this world. That is so true. And that's a lot of what I saw. And when I witnessed bullies um, at the schools, it was trouble at home. And it was younger parents sometimes that didn't have time for their kids. And what I realized is they always say teachers are like overworked and underpaid because yes. we do a lot of parenting as well you know and it's like you really have to be someone that cares about kids and students and not just their education but their well-being because a lot of times they're acting out because you know there's other things going on that their parents don't have time to uh recognize yeah yeah it's like I love crying out for help kind of yes yeah. exactly i was just about to say um <laughs> i listened to a lot of videos from louise hay and she's no longer with us, but she used to say, um, when a child is acting up, it's not because they're a bad child. You have to stop and think, why is this child acting out? What is going on? Like you have to pull the lens back and just think what is going on? Because it's usually, like you said, it's just like the lack of attention or love or, you know, anything at home. And sometimes you can't blame the parents because they too are just surviving. You know, they're just surviving and trying to make ends meet and they're working two to three jobs just so they could put food on the you know table and they really don't have time to do the emotional aspect part of it and helping them grow or helping them to learn how to self-regulate their emotions. Yeah, we have a big job. And I think anything that you do in media or education, it, we should just try to make the world a better place and help <laughs> Yes. That's what trying to do at least. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as we wrap up this episode, what would be your nugget of wisdom for anyone who is listening right now? Huh. Be fearless. I always I just love this title. I'm just looking at the word. Um and, you know, if you have anything that you desire to do, I believe we are all here for a purpose. Just be fearless. Do it afraid. Um and stick to your vision because it's your vision. Sometimes you see things and other, you share it with someone else, but it's not their vision. It's your vision. And if you stick to that vision, no matter how long it takes, I always say the provision will come. So if you have a vision, provision is there. And that can be in the form of money, support people, but just always stick to your vision. Be fearless. Don't give up. And the right people, places, and things will come to help you along the way. Ooh, I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Okay. How can my audience find you? Google. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, always, I just love saying that. No, but <laughs> um, I, my website is my first and last name. It's T-Y. It's spelled a little different. T-Y-M-E-K-A-C-O-N-E-Y.com. Uh, the books are on Amazon. Um, yeah, I, it, they can find me on the website and it has everything that I'm doing or plan to do in the future. And it links to my film festival website, the music website that you mentioned and all of the creative things. Yes. And we're also going to put all the links in the show notes. Thank you again okay. for listening.
Oh my God, this was amazing. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so happy to have you. <laughs> Thank you again for listening to Journey of a Fearless Female. I'm your host, Paola Rosser. If you're looking for a life coach or a spiritual mentor, you can book a free discovery call with me at www.fearlessfemale.com. You can also follow me on Instagram at fearlessfemale underscore coach, subscribe to my YouTube channel at fearlessfemale or find me on TikTok. I'm under at paola.rosser. And if you love this episode, make sure you hit subscribe, share it with your friends and leave a review. I read every single review and I truly appreciate the time you spend writing it. 